Okay, so thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to our Google Hangout on War on Mars. My name is Jacqueline and I am doing a PhD researching into signs of life on Mars. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit today about um, what evidence there is for water on Mars. So I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. And... What I want to do first of all is ask you some questions. So, um, can anyone tell me what they know about water on Mars? Is there any water on Mars today? Mm, there's no water on Mars from in the current Was that there's no water on Mars? Yeah. Um, anybody else? Water, so, once upon a time, it was water on Mars, but, but then the sun rays dried it up. Okay, so that's really interesting. So you think there was water on Mars in the past. Um, so the answer is that yes, there is still water on Mars today, um, up to 5 million um, cubic kilometers of it, which is quite a lot. Uh, but present day, we think that uh, most of the water is in frozen form, so it's ice. Um, but if it were to melt, that would be enough to cover the whole planet to a depth of 35 meters of so That's quite a lot of water. Um, so a little bit of um, facts about Mars for you. Uh, since ancient times, we knew about um, at least five of the planets, and we could see that they moved in, in different um, movements of the stars and seemed to move relative to the stars. And so the word planet actually comes from uh, the word for wanderer, because the planets would wander around. And Mars specifically is named after the Roman god of war. And interestingly, the Roman god of war in legend had two horses that pulled his chariot into the war called Phobos and Phemos, and that's what the moons of Mars are called. Um, Mars is about half the size of Earth, about 10% of the weight and mass, and it has about one third of the surface gravity, so if you're on Mars you'd be bouncing around a lot. Uh, Mars's day is about the same as Earth's day, but the year is twice as long. Um, when we first saw Mars through telescopes from the ground, we couldn't really see much detail. And so these are some drawings from 1659 from a scientist called Christian Huygens. And you can see you can see a few patches that are different there, but not really much detail. And in the late 1800s, as telescopes got better, people started to see more different features on the surface of Mars. And here you can see some, um, some features here um, laid out. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I think these look a little bit like almost like roads or, or um, railway tracks or something. Um, what do they look like to you? Has anybody else got any ideas about what they might really be? I think they, I, I think they look like the, um, some water that maybe was frozen. Oh, okay, yeah, that's a really good shout. Um, anybody else got any different ideas of what they think these stripes and lines might be on the surface? I think they look like footsteps. They look like what, sorry? Footsteps. Footsteps, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so what what's quite interesting about some of the answers you've given there, someone said about water and frozen water, and we didn't see ice caps on Mars. And you mentioned the footprints, and actually some of these ground features are probably what they were recognizing as um, crater impacts from the meteorites that hit the surface of Mars. It seems like a footprint um, where these big rocks crash into the surface. And on Mars, um, we don't really have weather as much as on Earth because you haven't got um, rain, for example, washing away, and you don't have tectonic plates moving around and cleaning the surface up. So um, it's quite a a good signifier of how old the surface of the planet is, how many footprints or how many um, meteorite impacts we have. Um, then a little bit later, there was a scientist called Percival Lowell, and based on what he's seen from some of these images, he started to draw maps like this. And as a result of it, um, people started to think that there might have actually been civilization on Mars, and what we were seeing were signs of a cityscape or some sort of water system that was kind of bringing water down from the poles. And this started to really take off in the newspapers. And people were like, is there life on the planet Mars? First of all, well, was a really respected astronomer. And so people started to think that there might even be aliens there. And this led to a whole bunch of science fiction novels and radio shows and 
people writing about the possibility there might be a civilization on Mars. And it really fed into our kind of culture and society of little men visiting us and UFOs. And there were loads of famous stories written, like Wars of, War of the Worlds, and people thought maybe the aliens visit us. But as time went on and we started to build spacecraft and actually go and look at Mars in more detail, we started to see stuff like this. So this was a picture from America in 1994. And that showed a dry, um, boring landscape, a little bit like the moon. And so this really kind of killed the idea that there was civilization and aliens living on Mars. But just because they aren't alien controlled cities or spaceships doesn't mean that there isn't alien life on Mars. So that's one of the dilemmas. Is there anything up there that's maybe more bacterial? Okay. So um, in 1972, the mission went on with more of a clearer idea of, uh, of what was on the surface. And you can see those craters, the lightning packs, the big uh, panel or gully here. This is actually a really big um, uh, canyon, very much like the Grand Canyon, very much like the Grand Canyon. This whole thing is about the width of the land. It's pretty huge. Um, can anybody tell me what these features look like? Any suggestions what you think this might look like? It might look like some similar features we see on Earth. Seaweed. Seaweed? Someone said. Um, so what we're seeing here, they look really similar to what you see on Earth um, for river channels, dried up river channels. You see this nice flow shape here. And you do also get um, similar shapes of lava flows, but it really takes quite a runny bit like water. Hard, really um, sinuous, curvy shapes here. And you get really similar things on Earth where there's been long flowing water over the surface. But it can also be the result of um, maybe a, a flood event where you get water quickly carving out lots of things. But there's plenty of examples on Mars of this kind of stuff, sort of gullies coming down from higher ground. You see similar things like this on Earth. And this is one way that planetary scientists try to work out the history of what's been going on by looking at similar formations on Earth where we have a better idea of what's happened and we see present day literature and then compare that to the evidence we see on other planets. Um, so here's a really nice example. You can see here all these nice curvy channels. You get these sort of like streamlined island shapes built out. And then you can see almost like river deltas like you might get at the end of the River Nile in Africa, spreading out into sort of flatter flood pellet plains. So as someone mentioned at the beginning, there's plenty of evidence that there was uh, maybe different type of um, uh, system on, on Mars a long time ago. But it seems pretty dry now. So that's one of the big questions. Why is Mars so dry? So what I'm going to show you here is an example of what you see in science, which um, is quite an advanced uh, thing really in physics about phases of different things. So can anybody tell me um, different forms in which water can exist? So you've got liquid water and you've got ice and you've got vapor. Does anybody um, know what temperature uh, ice turns into liquid and then liquid turns into vapor or steam? Anybody know what temperature water boils or freezes? Zero degrees Celsius. Oh yeah, that's brilliant. So yeah, zero degrees Celsius is where um, where liquid um, goes from freezing to liquid. So you put things uh, in the freezer, and when they get down to cold enough, to zero, they'll turn into ice. And this phase diagram explains that. So here we have the Earth. But one thing we we always tend to think about what water does here on Earth, and that's subject to depending what temperature and pressure things are. The so Earth sits here, and on this side, on the left hand side here, you've got the pressure, and Earth sits at one atmosphere. And so this means as it moves across this phase on the ground and moves over to this line here, the boundary between ice and liquid, this is at zero degrees on this bottom line here. And then it keeps moving up, getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter until it hits this line here, which is at 100, so water boils at 100 degrees. So this phase diagram tells us at what temperature and pressure water will change its phase from solid to liquid to vapor. But this only applies if you're looking at the kind of pressures and temperatures we have on Earth. 
when we look at Mars, um, Mars sits much lower down, it's got much lower pressure and also much lower temperatures. So Mars is just below this boundary here, and so it never really gets to go to the liquid part. It just goes straight from ice to vapor. And so this is why we don't see liquid water very much on the surface of Mars today, because it's sitting way lower pressure, and it doesn't get to travel through that phase of liquid. So this is um, what they call the triple point here, is um, the point where all three of those phases meet. And that's um, where you get your boundaries between your ice, and your steam and your liquid. And so on Mars, instead of melting through the liquid phase, things go straight from the solid to the vapor phase, and that's called sublimation, which is really important on Mars, and it um, drives a lot of processes on the surface. So what does this mean about conditions in the past on Mars? So we were looking at some of those pictures that had riverbeds, and we know that the um, temperature and pressures are much lower on Mars today but we can see evidence that there was liquid water. So what does that tell us about the temperatures and pressures on Mars in the past? Has anyone got any ideas what it might have been like in the past on Mars? Amy said there used to be rivers, but then they turned to steam. Okay, so I mean, that's definitely what would happen today. But if we think that there were rivers and maybe even lakes on, on Mars a long time ago, it means that the temperatures and atmospheric pressures must have been higher. So that makes us ask, well, what happened that they're so much lower today? Because if they used to be higher, there would have been liquid water. And the answer comes from magnetic fields and the sun. So the Earth has a really strong magnetic field, which protects us from a lot of the solar wind or like radiation and energy coming from the sun. And that sun is constantly um, sending out energy that hits into the Earth's atmosphere and it starts to strip away particles in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, but our magnetic field acts as a shield and protects us from that. And the reason we have a magnetic field is because our Earth is what they call differentiated or has different parts inside of it. So you have a solid inner metal core, then a liquid outer metal core, and then finally your crust and mantle at the edges, which are what are we more familiar with. The crust is very rocky. Um, and what we're familiar with on the surface. But deep inside, that liquid core spins around. And because it's spinning liquid metal, it creates a magnetic field. And so this is what keeps us safe. And this is just a little example of the kind of thing our magnetic field looks like. And if you've ever got to do an experiment with iron filings in a magnet, you can um, make these sort of shapes on paper with metal and magnets, and this kind of a magnetic field that surrounds magnets. So the Earth's a big magnet, basically, inside. Um, the problem with Mars is that its inner metal core is solid, or at least no way near as runny as Earth's. So it doesn't have this spinning metal core, and so it can't create a magnetic field to protect it. So why did Mars lose its magnetic field? Well, in physics, when things are smaller and they have a um, smaller surface area compared to their mass, they get colder quickly. So you can imagine if you made a really big pot of soup and left it on the side, it might take half an hour to cool down. But if you just took a small bowl of soup out and left it on the side, it might um, cool down to room temperature within a few minutes. And this is because uh, the less massive something is, the quicker it cools down because of how much surface area it has. And so Mars has cooled down because it's so much smaller than Earth. And so you can see here it's about half the diameter and half the size of Earth there. Um, and this means that Mars doesn't have that lovely um, big magnetic field. So when the solar wind comes in, it just pushes into the atmosphere and strips away everything in the atmosphere. So we think that Mars used to have a much thicker, stronger atmosphere and that it had a magnetic field to protect it. And therefore, it would have been able to have liquid water on the surface because of the higher pressures. But here we have an example of um, some pictures from Mars shown on the left here in November 2010 and on the right in May 2013. And you can see there's been a change. In it. it looks like something run down the surface here and made this little extra gully on the right. So we have seen some evidence that there being liquid water on present day Mars. And here's some more examples of these um, little um, dark streaks you get on the surface that seem to get longer over spring and summer. And this looks like it might be the evidence of water running on the surface of Mars today. So what could be in the water that might make it melt. We know that pure liquid water can't exist on the surface. 
but does anyone know of anything that can make ice melt without just heating it up? Anyone got any ideas? I'll give you a clue. Um, in the winter when the roads are icy, they might use something like this um, to melt the ice. Charlotte says, what about light? Did you say light? Life. Life, oh, that's really interesting. That's a really interesting idea actually, because um, we know that um, organisms can uh, generate heat and be warm. Um, so that's a really good idea. Um, this one though, they think it might be more of a chemical thing. So has anybody got any idea of what they put on the roads in winter when it comes to stop, stop cars slipping around? Dido said grit. Grit, okay, oh. so that's exactly right. Um, and the grit has lots of salt in it. So here we have an example of one of the spreading lorries and the grit that they put down on the road, um, it has salt in it and salt can change the temperature at which um, ice turns into water. So this is what we think happens. We go back to our fire phase diagram. And we know that Mars was sitting down here at that triple point where it went straight from ice to vapor. But if we add some salt to that water, it moves Mars up on the phase diagram so that it can now head into the liquid part. And what we think might be happening with some of those dark streaks is that there's salt in the water. And we know there's salt on Mars because we found evidence of it with landers and rovers and also with orbiters. We know there is salt on Mars. So if you have salt in the water, that might mean that it can stay liquid on the surface at least for a short time. Um, now, recently there's been a new discovery of water on Mars. Did anybody hear anything about a new discovery of water on Mars recently? Grace says the polar ice caps. Ah, fantastic. Yeah, that's brilliant. So, um, the polar ice cap on the south pole of Mars, um, for a long time people thought that maybe underneath the ice cap, where it's deeper under the ground, there might be enough pressure to change the pressure for that phase diagram that water could exist. And recently, um, somebody found evidence of an underwater liquid lake. But I wanted to ask you if you had any idea what might we use, what kind of technique might, might we use to look under the ground because we can't see this liquid lake from the surface. So does anyone know of any technology or, or technique to look underneath things so that we can see what's below stuff? We could send in a drone that has a drill. Oh, fantastic that you said that actually, and um, that's one of the things that's going to be happening. So at the moment, we haven't been able to send anything that can dig under the surface. But there is a rover going up in 2020 from the European Space Agency that has a drill on it. That drill is about two meters long, and that's going to drill into the surface to see what the conditions are like deep in the surface and look for signs of life under the surface. Um, but this lake is much deeper than that. So um, what we use to look at that is radar. Um, so, have you guys heard of radar before? So, radar, we use that a lot. A lot of um, ships and aeroplanes use it to look for things, and it stands for radio detection and ranging. And we um, invented radar, um, for humans at least, um, during the Second World War in order to spot planes that were flying. Um, and it's actually very similar to something that happens in nature already called echolocation. So bats and dolphins, they have a, a way of seeing things in the dark or really far away that they can't see with their eyes. And they emit a sound and that sound wave moves out, hits into something that they want to catch or avoid and bounces back. And what they do is their brain can work out the time it took to bounce off of something and which direction it's coming back from. And they can use that to sense things without actually seeing them. Um, so radar does this, but using radio waves for echolocation. And so um, we use this for aircraft, ships, we even use it to monitor rain clouds. And so what you have is a transmitter that creates the radio waves, which is similar to the bat making a sound. And then an antenna that directs the radio waves, and then it hits into um, the object comes back and the receiver measures the waves that are bounced back and it can measure the time and direction it takes to come back and it can tell what's there. And what's good about radar is that um, in some wavelengths, different wavelengths, it can actually see through things to look underground. So here's an example of some wavelengths and you have X-band radar 
and then P-band radar, which have different wavelengths. And so they can look at different things. Some of them might be able to look at the top of a tree, whereas others will go through the leaves because the wavelength is different and go to the floor. This enables us to kind of look through things and we can even look through ice and sand to see what's below. So as somebody mentioned before, the Mars South, South Polar Caps have had this discovery and they use this radar thing um, to have a look underneath the ice layers of the South Pole. And just here on the right, you can see these bright blue patches and this seems to be um, evidence of where the radar has hit into a uh, watery surface. And so we think that there might be um, liquid water. But as someone else said, until we go and drill down there, we won't really know for sure. So and there is some evidence of liquid water on present day Mars. Um, and there almost certainly used to be lots of water, but there is still plenty of water. Um, does anybody here know the chemical formula for water? Chloe says H2O. H2O, fantastic. And that's really, really good. Does anybody know what the H and the O stand for? One hydrogen atom and two oxygen atoms. Oh, very close. So it's two hydrogen and one oxygen. But yeah, that's really, really good. So H2O, two hydrogen, one oxygen. And that's what makes water. And so this is how we write it. So we write the H for hydrogen. And then the two shows how many of those atoms there are. And that's been after. Uh, but water ice is not the only type of ice in Mars. Um, this is that picture of that South Polar cap. And although most of it underneath is made of water or H2O, um, the top layer is made of something else. And that is carbon dioxide or CO2. Um, so does anybody know what? We know the O is two oxygen atoms here. Does anybody? Um, oh, sorry, it's already here. Carbon dioxide. So we're all familiar with carbon dioxide. You might um, see it used for effects to make sort of smoky effects because it does that sublimation thing where it turns from a solid um, to a vapor. But also every time you breathe out, you're breathing out carbon dioxide and plants breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe, breathe in oxygen. So it's really quite common around the universe and there's plenty of it on Mars. And one of the interesting things it does is because of the way um, it it moves around from season to season. It makes this really cool pattern on the South Pole, and we only find this on the South Pole of Mars. We don't see it anywhere else. Um, and NASA have given this a special name. So I wanted to ask you guys, um, is there anything you think this looks like? If you were gonna name it and give it a special name, what would you, what would you say it looks like? Jasmine says it looks like when you mix oil and water. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I see that, definitely, because you'd get the sort of water flowing, floating around the surface and little sort of um, uh, bubbles on top of the surface. Any other ideas? Grace says bubbles. Bubbles, yep, yeah, yeah, it does look very much like bubbles. Um, NASA decided they thought it looked like Swiss cheese. So you often hear that the moon is made of cheese, but um, there is actually Swiss cheese terrain is the name of it. Um, formation on the South Pole, of Mars, the only place we find it. And here's some more examples of this sort of Swiss cheese formation. And it seems to have a life cycle where um, the ice sort of cracks and then it makes these big pits and then it erodes away. And this is the only place we find it. And that's quite interesting because we think of maybe some of the mechanisms on Mars are driven more by CO2 ice than water ice. So that's something we're still investigating. And here's an example of. Um, a few years of pictures of this Swiss cheese terrain moving around. So it's really quite dynamic. A lot of people thought Mars was quite a dead planet, like the moon, um, but actually it has quite a lot going on, especially at the polar caps. And with the discovery of this liquid uh, lake of water that might be under the South Pole, this has really um, uh, important consequences for whether or not there might be life on Mars. Um, so why is liquid water important? What do you think the relationship is between the history of water on Mars and a search for life on Mars? Why is, why is water so important? We have life needs water to survive. Yep, fantastic. So that's basically everything we know about life. Um, we know that water seems to be one of the things that's really critical for life. We've found all sorts of extreme life on Earth. We found it living at the bottom of the ocean where there's no sunlight. We found it living in boiling water. We found it living in frozen ice. Um, we found it in all different types of um, environments that are really salty or really acidic. 
But one thing that we think is really important is that liquid water needs to be around for life to exist. And so as somebody mentioned earlier about, um, about digging under the surface, here we've got a picture of a couple of the rovers. On the left is the Curiosity mission from NASA. And this has a, a tool where it can use a laser beam to vaporize rocks and look at what comes off. And then the one on the right, which isn't up there yet, but it's gonna go up there soon. And this has the ability to drill under the ground. So these are all really important things for looking for uh, evidence of water um, because NASA has a, an idea that water is so important that they say follow the water, follow the water is their sort of catchphrase when you're looking for life. And it's not just Mars, if we look in other places in the solar system, we have moons around Jupiter and Saturn that seem to have liquid water um, underneath their icy surfaces. And so we think it's really important to try and find planets not just in our own solar system, but in other solar systems that have liquid water, because it's the only thing we know life really needs. Um, here we have an example of something that the rover found on the surface, um, one of the NASA rovers, and it found these little bubbles that look like blueberries, but they're actually um, little um, bubbles made of hematite, which is a mineral that can only form when you've got water sitting there for a long time. So we go to areas like this that we know have had liquid water in the past to try and look for evidence of life. Here you can see one of the pictures from the Curiosity rover that shows these sort of flat um, uh, panels on the floor that are similar to what we see in our lake beds in areas that have had water and then dried out. Um, and then we also look from orbit. We use orbiters to look for evidence of water and where the most water is to try and um, go and see what's there and see if there's any evidence of life in those regions. And hopefully, one day soon, um, we'll be able to send people to Mars. And then if you can send people there, you can do a lot more different scientific experiments, you can dig things up, and even live there. And if we live there, then we'll need water too. So I believe in my lifetime um, that we will send people to Mars. But it will be people who are your age now who are going to be those astronauts and scientists and engineers developing that. So I think it's really important that we think long term because these space missions take 10, 20, 30 years to develop and then um, launch and get to the destination. So it won't be people my age that are um, going and doing this science. It will be people who are your age now who are leading the way with it. So um, I definitely encourage you to ask questions. And there's no such thing as a stupid question. It's what scientists do is ask questions. And every time you answer one, you normally have another 10 that come up. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Jasmine asks, how long will it take to go to Mars if we go? Ah, okay, so um, if we go to Mars um, as humans, I think that might take quite a long time for us to do it. But the travel time to get there when Mars is at its closest is about five or six months. So we wait until the planets are kind of in alignment that it's quite close for us to get there. And that will take about five months to physically get there if you left today. Um, but for people to go there as a mission, I think it might take at least 10 years or more. Elon Musk, I don't know if you guys have heard of Elon Musk, who's a um, uh, SpaceX uh, company that they do all the putting car into space and launching the Falcon Heavy rockets and stuff. He's got an idea that he wants to send people to Mars in the next sort of, 10 to 20 years, but I don't know, I think there's a lot of technology that needs to be done and you've got to think about how people will survive the journey because we've never done a journey that had astronauts live in the International Space Station for months at a time, not travel between planets for that long. I mean, once you're on Mars, you're going to need to think about what you're going to eat and where you're going to drink, get your drinking water from and what fuel to get back. So I think it will probably be at least another 20 years until we think about sending people to Mars. Any other questions? Um, if there was water on Mars, who or what would use it? Ah, um, so if there is water on Mars, uh, at the moment, there might be microbes there using it. So they might be using it for their life processes. But if we went there, then we could use it to um, live. We could use it for our food and our drink and washing. And also, um, we can use it for uh, various technologies that use water pumps and stuff. And I think most importantly, you want to think about growing food and having greenhouses. I don't know if anyone's seen The Martian, but um, one of the things he does in this movie is he wants to grow potatoes. And he wants to for that. 
Um, so water is something that would be very, very important because the other thing is very heavy, so you wouldn't want to take water with you um, on a spaceship if you could help it because it would be really heavy and a lot of the problem with going to space is how heavy your rocket ship is when you want to launch it, so you wouldn't want to have too much water to carry with you. But having water there would be a huge advantage. There's actually lots of water ice on the moon as well. Um, so if we ever go and build a lunar base, then there's plenty of water ice on the moon, so we might be able to use that too. Any other questions? Would, would people be able to survive on Mars? Ah, so you would be able to survive on the surface of Mars if you had a spacesuit on for a short time. Um, but long term, you would want to have to build uh, what they call infrastructure. You have to have buildings and you have to have technology to protect you. And on the surface of Mars, there's a lot of radiation because I don't know if you guys have heard of the ozone layer. So um, similar to the chemical formulas we were talking about earlier, ozone layer is made of um, three oxygen molecules together, which is O3. And this is really, really good at protecting us from UV light. So um, although you should always wear something when you go outside, because some UV does make it through the ozone layer, um, that is what is protecting you from all the UV that causes skin cancer and burns your skin and gives you sunburn and you actually find that in areas where the ozone layer is thinner like in australia uh, there is a lot of uv radiation coming through which stands for ultraviolet radiation um, and on mars there's no ozone layer so the uv radiation there is really really strong you get instant sunburn if you expose your skin to that and very quickly kill anybody or any animal that was living on the surface so what you want is some sort of habitat that protects you from ultraviolet radiation. Um, you need to be uh, aware of how cold it is on Mars. It can get very, very cold there um, because it doesn't have a nice thick atmosphere to keep the heat in. Um, so you, you just freeze very quickly. The pressure is really low on Mars. So um, I don't know if you've ever heard stories of when you bring up deep sea fish from really deep in the ocean. They're so used to the pressure squishing on them that when you bring them up, they just expand and pop. And if you were to go into space or onto the surface of Mars without a spacesuit pressure in it, then um, yeah, it wouldn't be very good because everything in your side of your body would want to pop out. So it would really be quite a dangerous environment. But um, we have people living on the International Space Station, and that is a very dangerous environment on space. And we've built the technology to be able to have people live there safely with the nice temperatures and pressures. So it's something that could be done, but I think it would take a lot of engineering and hard work um, to get it done. Um, so you have to be very aware of your safety, and that's something that's really important in um, spacecraft engineering and in protocols for astronauts. They have to be aware of safety at all times because it's such a hostile environment. Any we other had, questions? We had a question of what's the atmosphere on Mars like? Ah, so that's a really, really good question. So we know that it's much lower pressure on Mars. So um, what we know about the atmosphere of Mars is that it's mostly made of carbon dioxide. Um, does anybody know what gas makes up most of our atmosphere here on Earth? Nitrogen. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Really, really good knowledge there. So our um, atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, about 70% nitrogen. Um, and then only a little bit of oxygen. I think it's about 18% oxygen, which is what we really need to breathe. And then you've got a whole mix of other gases. Um, on Mars, it's mostly carbon dioxide. There's a little bit of other gases and you've got some um, different compounds floating around there. Uh, but the really interesting thing is because of that loss of its magnetic field, it's got very thin atmosphere. So it's about 1% of the thickness of our atmosphere, which means that when the wind blows on Mars, Although it might be a fast wind, it's very, very windy because the atmosphere is just so much thinner. And so in sometimes in movies like The Martian, you see a storm blowing things around and blowing all their spaceships about. That wouldn't happen because it would just be like a very gentle breeze to you. Even if it's moving really fast, the atmosphere is so thin that um, it, doesn't, it doesn't blow like the wind. Yeah, I know we've got this big hurricane or storm hitting the United States the last couple of days, um, you wouldn't get anything like that blowing things around because the atmosphere is so thin. Zara asks, related to that, are there any seasons on Mars that affect things? Yeah, brilliant, brilliant question. So yes, um, the seasons on Mars uh, are about twice as long as the seasons on Earth. 
And a lot of people tend to think the seasons are to do with planets moving closer and further away from the sun. But actually, the main reason for different seasons is because of the axial tilt of our planet. So um, our planet is round, um, but it has, if you imagine a line going through it, it's actually about this angle. And so as it moves around the sun, it shows north and um, south hemisphere different parts of the um, parts of the planet at different times and this is exactly the same for Mars so our planet is tipped at an angle of about 23 degrees and it's actually really similar for Mars uh, but Mars is further away so it takes longer to go around the sun so you do get spring, summer, winter and autumn on Mars because it has a similar, similar axial tilt to Earth um, but it takes about twice as long um, also, Mars's orbit isn't quite as perfectly round, it's a little bit more what they call an ellipse. So instead of perfectly round, it's more sort of slightly more that shape. And that means that um, they have slightly longer winter in the southern hemisphere um, and shorter uh, summer in the southern hemisphere. So it's pretty similar to Earth, but on longer time scales. Uh, but also because they're don't have um, the atmosphere and the rain cycle and stuff that we, we get here. It's always pretty cold on Mars. They don't get nice warm summers uh, on Mars. So you, you wouldn't want to pack your swimsuit if you were going there. You definitely want to keep nice and warm. We also had a question. Oh, your turn. Yep, go ahead. How, how long is a year on Mars? Ah, so a year on Mars, it's about twice the, the length of a year on, on Earth, but I'm going to have to look that up because I can't remember. Uh, year length on Mars is 687 days. So um, ours is 365 days and theirs is 687 days. Um, and that's because it's further away um, from the sun and it takes longer to go round and there's a very specific set of uh, physical rules around that called Kepler's laws which tells us all about how long things take to orbit around things and the way they move around um, solar systems so the further out you go the longer the, the year is for different planets and so I think let me look it up if we look at Neptune which is the furthest planet that has a much longer year and uh, Neptune so Neptune's is 165 years is one year on Neptune because it's all the way out of the edge of the solar system. And then as you get closer in, they get shorter. So ours is 365 days. Any other questions? We had a question of, do you think they will find any new elements to the periodic table? Ah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think no. And if you look at um, the way that they define the different elements, it's all to do with um, the amount of uh, protons and electrons inside um, different elements. And they all um, fit a certain pattern. And there's, if you want to see an interesting story, you should go and read up about this guy called Mendeleev, who is the one who invented the periodic table. And he um, saw it almost like a code or a game where he had this grid and he could see that different elements had different numbers of electrons or negatively charged particles in the outside shell of the atom. And they all fit into certain patterns. And if you look on the periodic table, you have different groups that sit in different um, columns and they have similar properties. And they like to behave in a certain way. So one group is the noble gases that don't like to be up with anything. And you've got others that have similar properties that they're quite metallic or you have things that are radioactive and it's all to do with their arrangement and their size and where they sit in this table and so he was able to predict the discovery of new elements and he could tell you how many electrons it will have and what it will be like and what it will like to bond with and so we kind of know that uh, we've filled in that whole table now and if you look at the newest elements that have been discovered which we don't seem to really um be created naturally, we have to create them in labs. They're so big and unstable that they break down in a matter of milliseconds. Um, so I don't think we will find any new elements. We might be able to create new things in labs, but they break down so quickly that I don't think we'll find any new elements. But we might find new ways that elements and um, compounds behave in different um, circumstances. Because we think, for example, that inside Jupiter, hydrogen which is a gas here naturally on earth and we think that behaves as a liquid metal because it's under such huge pressures inside jupiter that it behaves differently so i think that's something we can find we can find um 
uh, things behaving differently in different circumstances that maybe we hadn't thought about. EVJ wants to know about how much petrol you'd need to go to Mars. <laughs> That's a really good question. I don't know is the answer. Um, I'm sure you could look it up and see what, how much fuel they use. Um, but one of the things they do in order to get to these really far away places, especially when you're sending stuff out to the outer solar system, is that they use gravitational assist, which is where you slingshot around other planets or stars to try and like get your speed up. And so you essentially use gravity by heading towards something like uh, another planet. And when you're sort of orbiting, you're actually sort of falling into something. And so there's sort of fall into it, speed up and then swing off and move on out. And so that's something we use to kind of minimize the amount of petrol. Uh, or a uh, rocket fuel you might need. Um, but I have seen some interesting things on YouTube where they've given you the equivalent um, in elephants. So instead of showing you in sort of litres or um, gallons how much petrol you use, they've used um, the equivalent for elephants. And somebody's done a, uh, if you look up um, the Apollo mission elephant fuel, you'll see somebody showing on the Apollo rockets going on the moon and how many um, equivalent elephants are falling out the bottom. And it's a lot. It's a huge amount of fuel to, to get off the planet because you have to be able to escape Earth's gravity and then head off into the solar system. Um, I think I've got time for one more question before I have to go. So if anyone's got one more question. Uh, Northbury, can we get a question from your side? Um, how many hours are there in one day on Mars? Ah, okay. So it's got a really similar... Um, uh, day to us uh, because of, so the the year is how long it takes to go round the sun. The day is how long it takes you to spin, and you get your day and night. Um, and I'm going to look up to get exactly uh, the length for you. And it's one day and 37 minutes. So 24 hours, 37 minutes is um, is how long the day is on Mars. So it's quite similar to us, um, but. They've got a different term. Instead of saying day, they say sol, which is S-O-L. And this is one day on Mars, it's one sol. And that comes from the word for the sun. The sun is called sol. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today. Um, you, I've had some really brilliant questions and you've all shown lots of really good knowledge. Um, and if you've got any requests for any other topics about different planets or space science, um, then please do email me and let me know. Uh, because I'll be able to find somebody else who's an expert on one of those things to, to give you a talk. So thank you very much for joining me today, and I hope you've had a good time. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.